Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to start by just going over microbubble agents and a little bit of basic information. Um, again, my disclosures were there, but I basically have some interaction with every ultrasound vendor and every ultrasound drug manufacturer. Um, so we know that ultrasound actually has high intrinsic uh, contrast between blood and solid tissues, and we use color Doppler, power Doppler, some of the new techniques, and we can see large vessels very well, but we really struggle with perfusion level, even with microflow or the newer techniques that are using a lower uh, filter to see that. And microbubbles do allow us to see this perfusion level, and it provides us some additional information that we can use to characterize lesion. And we know that in CT and MR, we always use contrast when we want to characterize things, and the same should be true of ultrasound. We would never try to characterize something on CT or MR without contrast. And the same should be true uh, with ultrasound. And these agents allow us to delineate vascular structures. We can enhance Doppler signals even in small volumes of blood called Doppler solvage. And actually, this is where these agents initially were used before we had inversion, pulse inversion and harmonics. We would just inject these bubbles using our standard Doppler techniques, and they would enhance the Doppler signal and give us an extra oomph to see things. So you still may want to use this in things like liver transplants where you're having a hard time seeing the hepatic artery or you have a portal vein and you're not sure um, if there's some thrombosis or not or a carotid artery if you're not sure it's 99.9% .9 occluded uh, versus totally occluded. This is another technique that we can use as high MI to enhance the Doppler signal. Um, and again, now with these agents, uh, we can image organs and lesion perfusion in real time, and uh, which we cannot do in CT and MR. So with CT and MR, we're taking snapshots in time. We don't know if we're hitting the times we need. So let's use focal nodular hyperplasia as an example um, to see that nice spoke wheel appearance in this flow coming from the center out is critical to make this diagnosis, but the timing to catch this on CT and MR is almost impossible. So with the real-time ability with uh, ultrasound contrast, that allows us to capture that information, and particularly in a lot of benign lesions where we're going to make the diagnosis with the arterial phase, watching what happens in that very rapidly changing arterial phase is how we can make the diagnosis, and we don't have that ability with CT or MR. So if we wanted to design a contrast agent, what we would do? We would like it to be easily administered, stable for enough time for us to do the examination, to have low toxicity, and to have acoustical properties that we would be able to detect with ultrasound and give us a high uh, contrast and high resolution image. And I think the agents that we have now actually do all those things. So how do these agents act? So there are properties of tissue that influence these images, our linear and nonlinear backscatter, attenuation, and acoustical propagation velocity. So many of these agents, um, the echoes from the blood uh, increase the backscatter as much as possible while increasing the attenuation of the tissue as little as possible. So again, we want to use these agents to enhance the vascular flow but not enhance the background signal. So we get a contrast-only image, and we'll talk about how we can do that, and I think the ultrasound vendors have come up with some very unique ways for us to do this at a relatively um, high rate of being able to subtract out the background tissue. So these agents are intravenously administered, and I know this is probably the, one of the biggest problems you have in getting this implemented. In most ultrasound departments, there is no mechanism to start an IV. So I'm in a very small private practice, and everyone in the center except the sonographer starts IV. So we just grab who's ever walking by and have them start an IV. That's probably not the same in larger centers. So you need to, in somehow in your facility, decide how you're going to do this, either training sonographers, which is probably going to happen, although there's some resistance to do that. I think we're going to have to do that uh, in the future, um, again, using CT, MR, Sonot techs, or even uh, a nurse in your department to do that is very helpful. These agents pass through the lungs and heart. Um, 
they were available only since the 1990s and in the United States uh, only from 2016. So in the United States, we're kind of far behind the rest of the world in the use of these agents. Um, they're now approved in 30 countries. I think a little bit more in cardiology than they are in abdomen, um, but I think abdomen's coming on board uh, as people recognize the advantages of this. Um, and these are universally adopted, are these encapsulated bubbles of gas that are smaller than red blood cells and capable of circulating freely in the uh, vasculature. So again, um, these agents are uh, a gas that's uh, a special gas that is stable, uh, and it's not air, it's, it's actually a specific gas. Um, these gases are actually used by anesthesia, and we know they're very safe, and they're surrounded either by a lipid or a lipoprotein shell to help them uh, with their stability. And each of the agents has the same recipe, but the gas may be different or the shell may be different. They're very small, one to seven micrometers. They're truly intravascular agents, and we'll talk a lot about today why this is important, because CT and MR agents are not. Um, we get thousands of these micro bubbles in a, a milliliter of blood. And obviously we're not using ionizing radiation, which is I think very important, particularly with children, uh, if we can eliminate a lot of radiation in kids that have a chronic diseases that require multiple imaging, this is very helpful. Um, there's no nephrotoxicity, so we can use these agents in patients with renal failure. Um, they're robust, versatile imaging. Um, and they dissolve in the circulation, and when they bust, the shells are metabolized by the liver, and the gas is expelled by the young lungs. So um, how do these work? Well, these bubbles actually oscillate when, and this is a slide from Stephanie, they oscillate when we resonate them. So at very low levels of power, um, we get a linear response. They kind of expand and contract about the same. As we start to increase the power, then the bubbles can expand more than they can shrink. So we get what's called nonlinear response. So because they can expand a lot more than they can contract, we get different responses when we do this. And if we increase the MI even more, we make them expand so much they explode. So we kind of have three different MIs that we can use. We can make them be linear response, which we usually don't use. We can have them um, in that it's still a low MI considered us when we knew, do our normal screening or ultrasounds, um, that they give this nonlinear response and we'll show that we use that nonlinear response to get a contrast only image. And again, if we use very high MIs, we just bust the bubbles uh, and they're gone. So to image these, we need to have contrast specific software. And this software is, allows this low MI in the region where we're getting the nonlinear response. Um, and we can do this in all, value, in all stages of contrast enhancement. The pulsing schemes may include words like pulse inversion, power modulation, harmonic imaging, or combinations of these. And each vendor has selected a combination of these which is, that works best on their machine. So um, if you want more information on this, I would recommend there's a Wolfram guideline on the physics of this that goes in great detail, or there's several papers by Mike Avercue, which is, who is a member of, uh, of ICUS that when it goes over in great detail each of these techniques. But again, for you using this, you really don't need to have any of that information. Um, the machines are very easy to use and what is on there has probably already been programmed by the vendor's engineers to be the best for their system. And again, these sequences take advantage of the nonlinear response of these bubbles. So let's look at the easiest one where we have pulse inversion. We send two pulses into the abdomen or wherever, and we're going to put one at zero degrees phase and one at 180 degrees phase. So they're out of sync from each other. Tissues always give us a linear response. So when we have these signals that are 180 degrees out of phase, when we add them together, they cancel each other out. So we don't see any background tissue. But because the we're using the nonlinear properties of these bubbles, that we don't get the same response. So we get different responses. So when we add them together, we now get signal. So using these techniques, we get signal from the bubbles and we cancel out all the background tissue. So we have excellent background uh, suppression, which we really cannot do with CT or MR. 
Um, and again, another thing we can do is we can, instead of adding these together, we can subtract the, the linear responses. So we end up adding them together and we now get our B mode image back. So we can now have both a real time B mode image. It's not gonna be as good as our standard B mode image, but it'll at least allow us to flag where a lesion is to know exactly where you're at. And then we can have our non-contrast image. So we get the best uh, of both worlds. So again, there's harmonic imaging. We use the linear response and the nonlinear responses we've talked about. We do this with an MI that we get the nonlinear response from the bubbles and a linear response from tissues. Um, and um, these micro bubbles actually generate uh, the harmonic imaging. And these are really um, true blood pool agents. And um, before we had these stable micro bubbles, the, the first uh, ultrasound contrast was really done in 1968, where we just took saline and agitated the hell out of it and made bubbles and injected those bubbles. Um, and we did, and this was done for cardiac reasons, and it actually did provide some enhancement, but these bubbles were not very stable. So after a few uh, cardiac cycles, they were gone. Um, and again, was helpful, um, and it took quite some time before we ended up moving forward to get these stabilized bubbles. Um, so again, we now have these gases that are not air, but there are different gases that are relatively stable in blood, and we have this protein shell, which also allows them to last longer. Um, and again, um, these lipid shells vary depending on which vendor you have. Some are a little more fragile, some are more um, stable. So we're gonna call what we're using now second generation. The first generation was kind of levovist. Um, again, didn't last very long. It did provide some information, but for most of the things we do now with contrast, really wasn't very helpful because of the limited uh, time that we had to use these agents. So these second generations have increased backscatter they last longer in the circulation, at least five minutes. So with some of the newer equipment, up to 10 minutes, even longer. Um, and they have these low soluble gases such as uh, perfluorocarbons. Um, and again, these are very safe agents. They're used in anesthesia all the time at much, much higher concentrations than what we're using. So again, we have three agents that are available in the US that are approved for one application at least. Um, all three of these are approved for cardiology. Um, sulfur hexafluoride, or Sonavu, and the rest of the world, Lumison in the United States from Bracco. Um, it is the only agent in the United States that's approved for liver imaging in both adults and pediatrics, as well as avoiding uh, cystourography, as well as cardiology. The other two agents, perfluterin microspheres from Definity and perfluterin protein type A microspheres, Optison from GE, are, are approved for cardiology. So you can use these agents as off-label agents, and with the new codes, you can actually get reimbursed for the off-label use of these agents. Um, if we look at the safety of these agents, and again, yes. Sure. So the new CPT codes that come out, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we'll present them a little bit later in the course. Um, the new CPT code agents are agnostic for organ as well as contrast. So you can bill for whichever organ you're doing. And my understanding is, even though the application is for abdomen, some people have been using it for carotids and other applications and are getting reimbursed. And the contrast, the CPT code is available and can be used with any of the three agents if you're using on-label use with Bracco or off-label use with Optison or Definity. And we'll give you the codes a little bit later in the talk because um, I don't have them here and I don't have them memorized. But if we look at safety, um, there have been hundreds of thousands of patients dosed with these contrast agents. And one of the largest studies uh, was uh, done by Dr. Pascalia in Italy, where they looked at 23,000 plus um, investigations. There were no fatal events. Although these fatal events can occur, they're extremely rare. They're rarer than in CT and MR. So you need to be prepared and have to have a crash cart in your ultrasound department if you're doing these. They had AEs in 29 out of this 23,000 patients. Only two were serious. Um, and they concluded there was a very good safety profile. 
I suspect that we've dosed somewhere between three to 4,000 patients since we've been doing ultrasound contrast, and we've never had a significant adverse event. Uh, event. Um, some people complain of a headache or a little back pain or a little nausea. It's usually gone within a minute. It occurs right after we inject. I think we had maybe two or three patients that at the end of the exam still had some lingering um, funny feeling, and we monitored those for another 20 minutes and taken their blood pressure. They all resolved by themselves without treatment, and we've sent them home uh, with no adverse events. So again, the adverse events are much lower than we see in CT and MR. And the one thing that we really want to emphasize is that our contrast agents in ultrasound are very different than MR and CT. And although the majority of the enhancement patterns and organs are similar, there is one major difference. And that is that the CT and MR contrast agents are very small molecules. They leak out of the blood vessels. So you can see here the contrast agent is falling out uh, of the blood vessels. So we can have pseudo-enhancement. We can have contrast that leaks into the interstitium and stays there. And we're really not looking at blood vessels. We're looking at enhancement of this excreted contrast in the interstitium. Whereas opposed to ours, where we have much larger, almost the size of a red blood cell, um, and these all stay within the vessels. So we don't have extravasation. And I'm sure Stephanie is going to talk a lot about this uh, when we talk about some of the liver lesions. Because if we have a leaky tumor that leaks out the MR contrast agents, we're going to get pseudo-enhancement. The enhancement is going to stay there, not because of it's in vessels, but because it's leaked out of the vessels and is in the interstitium, where we're going to have a completely different effect with ultrasound contrast because it doesn't leak out, it stays in the vessels. Um, so starting the IV, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, there's many options. Um, like I said, in our facility, it's not been an issue because everybody essentially starts IVs and we're a very small center, so it's very easy to find someone to do this. In your center, there are a couple options. Um, I know some big centers have a central station where a nurse starts all the IVs, and then the patient will go to CTMR or ultrasound. Others have a nurse in the ultrasound department. Um, some are training sonographers to start IVs. So again, it's kind of an institutional um, way that you're going to have to figure out what works best uh, in your institution. We like to use a three-way stopcock. Uh, as in here, and we'll talk about why shortly, but we like to have a very small, uh, short tubing, and the reason is we have very small amount of contrast agents. If we have long tubing, the agent may not get into the vein, or it may get diluted as we inject saline to push it forward. So we want a relatively short tube uh, for the contrast to go in, and then when we put our three-way stopcock, we want to put our contrast agent parallel so we don't increase the pressure going around the bend, and we put our saline perpendicular, and then we can use our little valve to control which agents we're going to inject. And we'll talk about a little bit later when you make boo-boos and turning the stopcock the wrong way. High pressure will always bust the bubble, so you have this other little clamp. Make sure that it's open. If it's closed and you try to force these bubbles in, as you increase the pressure, you're going to bust the bubbles. Um, so these bubbles are relatively fragile. You have to take care. You should also use at least a 20-gauge IV needle so that you don't have the pressure of them going through a smaller needle. For pediatrics, you can use a smaller needle, but then we recommend you don't inject quite as fast. You never want to feel pressure when you're injecting because that's causing bubbles to break. So let's talk about some of these agents. So sulfur hexafluoride, or Lumison in the United States, so of you in the rest of the world. Um, it's by Brocco. It comes in a nice little kit um, that you have the lyophilized powder, a 5cc pre-filled syringe with saline, a plunger, and a spike. So here's our little lyophilized powder. Um, you have a spike, the saline, and a little plunger for the saline. So you just insert all these pieces together as this. Then you push the spike into the vial, and you'll notice when you inject the saline, you'll have a white foamy on the top and a clear fluid on the bottom. And then you're going to shake vigorously. <coughs> 
excuse me, and as you shake vigorously, the solution will turn into a nice white milky powder. We always want to turn the vial upside down and look. Sometimes there may be some of the lyophilized powder sticking on the bottom. If there is, you want to keep shaking until you make sure all of that is suspended in the solution. It's also important to remember when you let these sit that the bubbles will fall down and, and separate out from the fluid. And if that does happen, all you need to do is again shake the vial again, or if you have it in a syringe, roll the syringe. You want to have the bubbles all suspended before you inject them. And again, you're going to withdraw uh, the amount of fluid you're going to need, and we'll talk about the volumes when we talk about specific organs. But in the standard dose for uh, Lumison by package insert is 2.4 milliliters. With the modern equipment, that's much too high, and I would recommend you would start with half that dose, 1.2. With some other equipment, you may even have to decrease uh, that. And again, we use a three-way stopcock, um, and uh, you have 2.4 um, cc's per vial. Definity comes with the saline fluid already in the vial, and you take the vial and you put it in this uh, little mixer, And the little mixer will agitate it. This is actually a dental amalgamator, what they use when they're making um, fillings for the dentist's uh, office. And this suspends all the bubbles. We don't need to watch 45 seconds. And then you take it out, and again, you have your clear fluid. And then uh, to take out the fluid, you, we like to put another little needle in to vent because we don't want to increase the pressure or decrease the pressure as we're taking out the bubbles. So we put a needle in to vent, and then we use a tuberculin syringe because the doses of Definity are about one-tenth of that of Lumison. So we're taking out 0.1 or 0.2 cc's, so you really need to use a tuberculin syringe. Again, we really like to use this three-way stopcock. Um, it allows us to do multiple doses without too much difficulty. Um, I prefer to inject 10 cc's of saline as opposed to 5 because I think it gives us a better bolus. Um, but uh, some people use 5. Um, and again, we'll talk about the boo-boos you can make if you turn the dial wrong uh, in one of my later talks. So again, when we look at these bubbles, they're very fragile. We don't want to change pressure. So again, you never want to inject with a closed stopcock. You always want to vent the vial when you're taking fluid out. Um, and you never want to reinsert the bubbles into their vial. Um, for our CPT codes, <clears throat> these are all unit dose. So you get paid for the whole vial if you use the vial or not. You just need to document what was used and what was thrown away. So there's no reason why you shouldn't. In the past, when we didn't get paid, we often did multiple injections, but don't tell Jayco, uh, from one vial. Um, and <clears throat> we could even sometimes get four injections out of one vial uh, when we weren't getting reimbursed. But now that we have reimbursement, uh, this shouldn't be a problem. Questions? Yes. I don't know that we really know. Some people think that the bubbles are getting into the blood vessels supplying the back. Uh, when we did phase two trials of Definity, we injected nine cc's, which is now 45 times the dose. We had more people complaining of back pain that was transient. Do you that it's related to the microbubbles going through the renal tubules, like the microtubules in the kidney. And um, I think that that is perhaps a little bit more common with Definity than with Sonoview. And it's absolutely transient, but um, the reason I think it is related to the renal tubules is that it is absolutely identical. And patients will often say to you, my God, I'm having a, passing a kidney stone. They don't even think it's related to the fact that, they're, that they've had an injection. And uh, so, so, but it's very transient. And so I agree with Richard, we've done just absolutely thousands and thousands of exams in our department. And although we do have a crash cart, I, may, I have my nurse maintain it to make sure that it's always up to date and that things aren't 
post dated that are in it, but we've never used it actually in the whole time that I've that I've been doing this. So we we keep it, and um, and uh, some of my European friends do say we've definitely had something happen, but it's really really a very very nice thing to do contrast ultrasound because it's a very comfortable thing. Patients like it. They come back and they'll have it again, and. Even patients who've had that renal colic, they, they're a little bit repetitive. Would you agree with that? So if we have patients, for example, that are post-RFA treatment that come back all the time, some people actually get that back pain. And so we ask those patients never to come dehydrated. Like I always tell them to make sure that even though we don't want them to eat before they come, to make sure that they're well hydrated both from the day before and the day of the scan. And I think that that minimizes it. And they'll come back again. It's not the kind of thing that they feel like, oh, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. I'll never run the risk of having that again. And some people will even let you do another injection even after they recover from the first episode of pain on that day. I think hydration is great for many things in contrast ultrasound not least of which is that if you start a lot of IVs every day and you have people in your population who are sick, as soon as you dehydrate them, you can't find their veins. And so it helps you just to, to find their veins too. So I encourage people not to eat and not to force fluids on themselves, but to be well hydrated. So, so nothing to do with the amount of the injection or the rate of the No, 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 I don't think anything. No, I think when we, like you said, when we were injecting huge volumes, when we were trying to do dose uh, studies, um, I think we did have more back pain at those huge, huge doses than we do now. And I think, again, as we've dropped the dose, we're getting less and less uh, uh, effects. So, um, and again, it may be a function of, like you said, timing. Um, I like to inject relatively fast um, so we get a nice tight bolus. Um, it may be that the, if you do that, you're going to get more effect. I would say probably less than 5% of our patients complain of anything. Um, and like I said, I think we've had two or three patients over the thousands that we've done that we've actually kept for 20 minutes to watch. We've never given them anything uh, for the reaction that they've all resolved spontaneously. So this isn't an allergy? It's no. We're trying to figure out how do you mark the So we don't mark anything. Um, some people have a funny taste in their mouth, which we figured out is actually from the preservative and the saline, not from the ultrasound contrast agent. So I think my, I'm next. Yes. Sorry. So and the next how to develop an ultrasound contrast program. Right. So Richard will now yeah, speak. Yeah, okay. No. No. So I think the package insert is just 20 seconds, but like I said, I like to turn it over. If you see white powder that hasn't been suspended, continue to shake it. No, it's, it's really trial and error. So we have a new machine too that we now use a quarter dose. Really. Yeah. So as the machines are getting better, we're using smaller and smaller. So it's just you're going to have to adjust. Um, I would assume the ultrasound vendors would give you some idea of what a dose is uh, most appropriate for their system. Yes. Right. Um, Stopcock's great. How much is left in the hub? The hub and the, the stopcock, can you, yeah. I've had, I don't know if we're injecting the whole dose when you're at less than 0.1. No, you're probably losing some. Um, you know, the other way of doing this is um, actually um, using a, a, a needle on the saline and a needle on the contrast, putting the contrast needle in farther and then the saline needle in not as far, you know, behind that. So then you can inject and then inject the saline. And we've done that. Um, in the past, too. Um, and again, you know, with someone agent, we were usually doing teeny weeny doses. Um, so it is kind of hard to control. Um, the other option is you, you're pulling up 1.15, maybe only 1.1 1 .1 is going in, and the other 0.5 is sitting in the, in the hub. Uh, Richard, I'll make two comments. 
So the first one is, um, in terms of what's in the hub, so, so I'm a Canadian, so we've had Definity approved since 2002. So even though today I use Sonoview and Definity, um, with Definity, um, it, whatever's in the hub is a full dose. And so um, the way Richard shows it is the same way that I do it. So we have the, the contrast going straight and then the saline flush on the 90 degree turn. But if you just want to use the hub, of course, you just leave your stopcock closed to the saline and then take a, sal a new saline and then push it through, like go directly in behind this, the contrast. Yeah, yeah, and so the, and the amount that's in the hub is a whole dose with, defin with Definity, and so not quite as easy with Sonoview. Now, Richard, the only other thing that I want to comment on, though, that you said was that although the new equipment that's out there, there's absolutely no question, I mean, I don't dispute you at all, that we just don't need as much contrast. But in terms of this room where people are starting, you might be starting, many of you will start with machines that aren't these super, super, super sensitive machines. And the machines that are out there, you need to have those doses, like you, that bigger dose. And so you don't, the worst thing that happens to your study is when you inject the contrast and you get a really, you know, a feeble, feeble arterial enhancement. And then in the portal venous phase, the bubbles are gone. And that's because you didn't inject enough. So you've got to make sure that you take experiment, in other words. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on.